Good afternoon and welcome to the UCL lunch hour lectures. On behalf of the organizers, I'm very proud to be able to present Ricky Deuce, who is a senior teaching fellow of entrepreneurial marketing and marketing analytics in the Department of Management Science and Innovation. And she will talk to us about the power of objects. Welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for spending your lunch hour with me. I appreciate that. So this talk, um, I want to look at objects and how we relate to objects and how objects relate to us. And what does this kind of relationship look like now and also in the future? So my talk has two parts. Part one, I'll look at the human in control. So I'll look at how we have used objects throughout time to extend ourselves, especially our physical capabilities. And I'll look at objects as tools. The second part will be slightly less comfortable, and we will look at the shift in power from the human onto perhaps what we can call a post-human evolution. So we're starting to question, and I want you to also reflect with me what is the role of objects? What is the role of technology in this post-human digital era? So objects, we have always used them. We have probably evolved with objects, and they have evolved with us. So primarily in the past, they were tools. They were part of our evolution, part of our extension, part of our humankind progression. But they were primarily there to extend our capabilities by being able to do things faster, quicker, higher, and so on. So, so that was their primary role. Today, we use objects in different ways. We use them to extend our sense of self, so our sense of identity, our sense of belonging, who we belong to and who we don't belong to as social communities and groups. So they still play a very fundamental role in how we understand ourselves and also in how we interpret other people around us. Now, objects are non-human. They're typically material, but also non-material. And we have these relationships with them as part of our, our everyday lives. What we sometimes do to make this relationship more comfortable is that we humanize or anthropomorphize objects. So we tend to see human features or personalities in objects. We probably all look towards the sky and see a face or a car or something else that was very familiar to you when you looked at clouds in the sky. So we do this on a regular basis. We see something human in what is essentially non-human. A couple of examples here, um, where we can see human features in a sink and also in a sip. So this is our way of coping with a world that we live in that is very material. So I have a little uh, quiz for you. So you see here four cars. Um, and the car is uh, an object that we typically humanize. So if you own a car, you may have a certain relationship with the car whether or not you want to realize it or not. So if we start with car one, what kind of emotion do you see it expressing? Yeah, happy could be one way of seeing this object, exactly. The second object, the second car, what sort of emotion, what kind of personality does it have, do you think? Stern, yeah. Me, okay. Yeah, I, yeah, so maybe aggressive, you know, it wants to get ahead in the world. We probably all know a person like that who sort of looks similar to this car. Oh, oops. <laughs> Getting to Kenya. The ne next one, yeah, looking very angry, maybe mean, like was mentioned before. And what about the last one? That is quite easy, I think. Yeah, shy, maybe a bit upset or sad. Yeah, so this is a way of making ourselves comfortable with a world that, to some extent, we don't really understand and we can't really relate to. Now, Sherry Turkle, who is a professor of science and technology at MIT, she's done a lot of research into our relationships with objects. And she has termed this notion of the um, 
relational artifact. So she believes that we create relationships with objects, but she also believes that we fill in both, part of that, both parts of that relationship. So we have emotions towards our things, and we also somehow think that they have emotions back towards us, or we would like to believe so. So that is what is happening. You know, things can't feel for us. They don't feel sympathy. They don't feel empathy. But we fill that part in, in that relationship. Objects that are designed to evoke emotions in us are objects like this. So the Furby, you have to look after it. You have to nurture it. I remember we once had one at home and it would start making noise in the middle of the night. We had to put a teeth out over its face to make it believe that it was nighttime so that it would go to sleep. It was ruling the home for a while until we found a way to shut it down. You've got the Aibo dog, a Japanese invention that is very much acting and responding and behaving like a real animal. And then you've got the seal, which is a technology that has been developed particularly for people who are lonely, older people in particular, who live at the old people's home, to try and create an emotional attachment that may have been lost as you have gotten older. What she wants us to question is, all of these technologies that we feel that we are developing relationships with, is that really so? What is happening when we create thicker bonds with technology than we do with people? What happens when we live through our screens? When we are more concerned about our second self online than nurturing our relationships with others in the physical world? Another way that we anthropomorphize and we create uh, ways of decomplexifying technology is in this example here. So an operating system is technology that most of us don't understand. How does it actually work? We, we understand it from a user perspective. We can navigate it. But how it actually connects is totally alien from us. So Windows 8, for example, the way they designed their operating system's interface is going back in time. They use sort of a tile um, imagery, like building blocks that we remember from when we were children. So it's playful and it's creative, and it's a very uh, approachable interface because we can't really get to grips with the technology behind it. So we are probably all of us sat in a meeting or in another situation, not particularly interested, taking apart the pen to try and find out how does it work. What are the parts that make up this tool, this piece of technology? And what happens if I deassemble it, if I take it apart? Can I put it back together? You know, I don't know if you feel the same, but often the spring is missing, and you can't actually click it through. But we enjoy this tinkering with objects, this playing with objects, seeing what they consist of, and being a, a creator. You can actually change objects which we can't when technology is so complex that we don't actually know how it works. So a team of researchers have looked at this tinkering culture, this maker, this hacker culture, where you are you're seeking a time when you could understand how to make a kite. You know how the technology works, how the objects tie together, what you'll be able to create in terms of functionality. We knew what was under the hood of our car. Now it's wrapped up in black plastic. We don't know what's underneath. We can't get access to the technology. The same with our mobile phones, especially the iPhone. It is put together in such a way you can't get access to the spare parts. You can't replace the battery. So there's an inbuilt product life cycle lasting about two years. Typically, the product will break down, and you can't get in to replace the parts that are no longer working. The transistor radio. What happens today is that technology is binary. It's either on or it's off. It's either working or it's not working. There is no in between. So you either got a signal and you get a radio station, or you don't have signal and you don't get a radio station. So with the old transistors, you would be a part of creating, finding that channel, tuning it back and forth. You would have a physical sense for how the object works and that is slowly being removed in our contemporary society. So there are different communities, um, 
playgrounds for people who like to tinker, who like to get physical with the objects, who like breaking things. That's another message that is coming out of this sort of revolution, that we are too afraid of breaking things because we don't know how to put it back together. So we become careful. We avoid discovery. We avoid going down the unknown path because we don't know how to make our way back. So we live in a world that we are scared of, with technology that we don't know how it works. So this is a response to that. Let's go back to a time when we can afford to break things and we can put it back together. So that's part one, looking at how we are in control of objects, at least to some extent, how we have used objects as tools to create human enhancement and progression. The next second part, I want to focus and put this sort of, flip this round and see what happens as we slowly lose control. As technology gets even more complicated, we become even more alienated from our surroundings. We live in systems that we can't challenge. That's sort of the message for the next part. <clears throat> so one of the, the popular images of this coming together of the man and the machine is the cyborg, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, which primarily comes through the science fiction movies. So it's a physical integration of a human being part machine. And this challenges what it means to be human. So if you ask a person, what does it mean to be human? Oh, we got intelligence, we can think, we can act, we have control of our decision making. That is also what's happening to machines. What we see in these movies is that is challenged. We no longer are the superior race on the planet. We no longer are in control of our future, what is happening next, as the machines are coming in, taking over our civilization. So I spent a bit of time with uh, robots to see what is it like to be around the non-humans who are slowly making their ways, way into our society. Uh, this is a, obviously not a super sophisticated uh, robot, but it is a robot, and it does give you eye contact. Uh, it's got an eye in the middle of the forehead, which can be a bit creepy, and it responds as you walk around it, it will follow you, so not very comfortable. And uh, you may see that I look a little bit eerie, uh, it actually puts its hand up behind my back. You know, we are friends. Uh, it's not a very comfortable feeling. So being around uh, a non-human, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. It's, it's not the... The other one here is a robot that actually copies your face. So as you get within a certain distance, maybe to make conversation or to show that I'm your friend, therefore I'm going into your personal space, it takes on your face. So rather than looking at something that is definitely not you, they're trying to humanize the robot, make it in a way part you, part machine, which is also a bit eerie. So this is where the technology is moving in terms of robot design, the humanoids. They want to make them look human, but not so human that we can't distinguish, because that is just too creepy. Although the Japanese always take it one step further. So they have designed humanoid robots, and I challenge you to tell me which one is the robot. Number one or number two? Are you sure? You wanna look again? Number two? Number one, okay. Anyone else on number one? Okay, a couple, three people number one, okay. Well, most of you are right. It is number two, who is the robot, but it is very hard to distinguish. And if you, if you watch them live online, you will see that their behaviors, their manners, their way of speaking, I'm not that far off uh, our human ways of doing things. Now, the cyborg we've also seen in popular culture, so it's not just in the science fiction world. Uh, we see it uh, with pop artists who are performing and looking half human, half machine. We also saw it at the Paralympics a couple of years ago, this prosthetic um, man-machine came into our awareness a lot more. Uh, with the Paralympics, and obviously uh, the slightly infamous Oscar Pistorius leading that. Uh, yeah. and we've also seen in the news in relation to different wars and bombings around the world. So it's, it's becoming a very, um, sort of a, we are very aware of this phenomenon of the prosthetic. So it's perhaps becoming less alien to us than it were 
when we only associate it with the cyborg, with the science fiction movies. The prosthetic has developed over time from something you probably didn't want to wear, like the toe at the top, to technology that became more and more functional. Until now, we have the bionic technology, which is sort of the latest step in the development of prosthetic technology. So these are limbs that respond to your physiological movements. They are tied in with your nerve systems. They are as close to your real limbs as possibly can be at this moment in time. As part of my research, I have looked at what it feels like, what it, what's the experience of living with technology, specifically uh, prosthetic limbs. So what does it actually feel like? How do you live your everyday life? What kind of relationships do you form or do you not form with these prosthetic objects? So I spent some time with uh, people who have prosthetic legs. And these are some of them. So you will see that they perhaps don't look very futuristic. And that is the reality for a lot of amputees who live with prosthetic limbs, that they look something like this. So here you see the leg has been covered with foam. The, the person has actually had, had it tattooed to make it look more real. So his other leg also has tattoos. So there's a, an effort here to humanize the leg and kind of embrace it as part of the person's uh, actual body. Whereas the person behind me, he wanted to keep the leg uh, more um, technical. So it's got the bare hole. It's more convenient. It's more practical for doing sports and hiking and so on. So what I found when I looked at these relationships between the people and the prosthetic limbs is that the prosthetics have a lot of power. They have a lot of control over the person and in some cases really dominate that relationships. So they construct the everyday. They make decisions on how to approach a set of stairs, how to approach a crowded supermarket, where to park your car. They really influence all of those decisions are taken in collaboration with the leg because the person knows the limitation that the leg's leg has. So you're not free to act like you would have if you didn't have that prosthetic. So it's kind of a, a hybrid. It is, in a way, the cyborg, but it's every part of the day is made in collaboration with the leg. So the leg also experiences the world. So when the person walks around, feels the ground underneath him or her, it kind of it responds. Uh, sometimes it, it will crawl out, <laughs> sitting on the bus or on a bench in a supermarket. The leg will just come out, and it will try and experience what's going on around it. It will prevent the person from going down certain roads that are uneven or uh, maybe that has gravel, things like that. So it's, it's very much embedded in the physical world along with the person. The leg is also a friend and an enemy. So depending on how your relationship is, for some it's a very positive relationship. I couldn't live without it. It's part of me. You know, I call it Mr. Leg. It's my friend. And for other people, it's, uh, it's sort of uh, not a very good relationship. Um, they talk about the unpredictability. You know, I can't rely on it. It, it behaves in a way that I can't control. Um, I can't rely on it in certain situations, and so on. So it's a very mixed relationship uh, these people have with their prosthetics. Now, we have always lived with prosthetics in one way or the other. The prosthetic limbs are obviously to replace lost capabilities, but throughout time we have integrated ourselves with objects. So it's not a new thing, and the cyborg has always existed, and we are all cyborgs, whether you wear glasses or have other devices that you use, other technologies to support you. What is happening is that a lot of the technology we use are there to extend not just our physi physiological capabilities, but more so our mental capabilities. So technologies like these, Google Glass, I'm sure you've seen, and also um, fitness wristbands that measures our every move, tells us whether we need to drink more water, whether we need to sleep more or sleep differently, or whatever it might be. So we are extending ourselves with these modern technologies into a place where we are trying to enhance what it means to be human. So being human is no longer enough. We need other technologies to either improve ourselves or give ourselves new capabilities. So it's worth reflecting on what does it mean to be human today? 
It's certainly not what it meant just a few decades ago because of the, this in sort of intrusion of technology and how it's embedded into our everyday lives. Right, I want to uh, give you a break from me and show you a little clip from a movie that I'm sure most of you have seen. And it is, I've chosen this, you'll see why I've chosen it. But anyway, I'll just play it actually. So, 2001 Space Odyssey, made in 1968. Pretty much looks like the present, if you ask me. So, mutual communication between us and machines. Can you think of any technology where we can do that currently? We can talk, it will answer. Yes, exactly, it's one of them. So, Siri, part of the Apple range, you will ask it a question, it will give you an answer. Sometimes not the answer you were looking for, like in this case. Sometimes not a very useful answer, like in this case. So the technology that creates communication between us and it is already there, which Stanley Kubrick predicted would come to us in 2001. So this kind of technology, such as this, I don't know if you have seen it, it's called Amazon Echo, it's a fairly recent uh, technology that's been introduced. <clears throat> it is a piece of equipment that you can have in your house and you can ask it questions, you can ask it to put uh, food in your shopping list, you can ask it questions about the tallest building in the world and it will answer, it will give you a reply. You can ask it to play your favorite music or a particular playlist and it will do that. So it kind of becomes a part of your family and that is how it's being portrayed in the commercials. So everyone gets together around this piece of technology, get excited and you can ask it and it can hear you from anywhere. So what it made me think of was that this kind of knowledge base in the olden days used to perhaps be an older member of the family, someone who had lived through life, who had the experience, who'd gone through difficult things, overcome it, who would have that knowledge to bring on to the rest of the family. So now that knowledge that we used to acquire and gather and disseminate is now embedded into a piece of technology that we can talk to and it will respond. So for me, it definitely raises the question about knowledge gathering, exploration, discovery. Because a piece of technology like this may have all the answers. We won't know if it's correct or incorrect because we don't know how tall the tallest mountain is or in this example, how to spell cantaloupe. So we will become ever more reliant on what is already programmed into these small machines. They will tell us what is the truth and where we came from, which was all about exploration, trying to go further, like we saw in part one, we will stop doing that, and we have already stopped doing that. We have stopped getting lost. We have stopped breaking things because we can't explain how it can connect back together. And we will continue to put more emphasis and build further relationships with these technologies who don't care if you lose your job. They couldn't care less. They might say, oh, I'm very sorry, but they actually won't relate to you. Another uh, example, so you were mentioning Siri, and I um, don't know if you've seen the movie Her, which is exactly that, where you start having this relationship with the operating system. And it's very real. It's even better than the real thing. You can shut it down as well. You can disconnect it. But it is nowhere near human relationship. And that is what we are starting to do. We are replacing technology with human relationships because in one way, they're a lot easier to manage. We can just switch the thing off. We can just buy a new piece of technology. We can just upgrade it. You can't do that to human beings. Technology is a lot, more, it's a lot simpler. Humans are complex and they change and they behave in ways that we can't explain. Not just our relationship changing and 
we put more emphasis on the relationships that we can create with technology. Our ability to, as I mentioned, explore and our ability to make decisions are also being diminished. I'll give you an example here of Netflix. Don't know how many of you um, have Netflix at home. But once you start watching a few movies or series, it will start recommending you what to watch next. So as we think we are getting more and more choice with this technology, I have the whole database of movies at my fingertips. What is happening is that by not exploring on our own, by not coincidentally ending up watching something totally random, we are following the recommendations, the prescriptions within the system. In this case, Netflix. It might be Tesco, it might be Amazon. The systems are the same. They think they know us by looking at our past behaviors and patterns, but we also evolve. And we will find it easier and attractive to pick from the selections that are being made and put in front of us, because it's an easy solution. But we, we will continue in the same tracks that we were in yesterday, because we won't explore outside of the boundaries that are being presented for us. So that is something we need to reflect on and think about. And if we don't want to continue down that route, we need to take action to go in a different direction. The same is with the satnav. Probably most of us can't live without a satnav because we don't know the routes, we don't know the roads. So we follow the routes that are being laid out without thinking, is this the best route possible? What do I know about traffic at this time of day on this type of road? probably you would be able to navigate much better yourself. But we want to make life easy. So we put the control, the decision-making power onto the technology, and we just sit back and let it tell us where to go. And maybe we need to think about how we could do that differently. It is not just the physical technologies that are shaping society that we live in. It's also the digital technologies, the online technologies, such as social networks and the social media genre. Another clip from a movie, uh, 1984, predicting the future, which I think you may agree we have already far surpassed, where we are controlled. We are living in a society that is prescribed. An example is the gaming community. <clears throat> I was listening to The Digital Human, which I strongly recommend from the BBC, and they were talking about what gamers do and what they've always done is they try and look for the boundaries of the game. Where does the game finish and where does it start? Games are supposed to be infinite, online games. So they're looking for these glitches in the game and the boundaries because that is what is human to us. When we look for the beginning and the end, how can we break something? They're looking to break the game, to challenge the boundaries that have been set within the game. Social networks and other digital institutions and architectures. What I think personally is that they are not there to do good for the human being. They are not there to evolve our relationships with others. They are there to keep us, keep us within constraint, um, like a maze and we are diminishing our relationships with others. We are not bothering to pick up the phone and going and see somebody if we can just text the person. So these are little behaviors that are changing over time and we are just embracing them and accepting them because that's the newest technology and everybody else does it. And we are not thinking about how it's affecting us and the people around us. So again, if we can try and reflect on how it's changing our behaviors, and our minds, the way we think, the way we make decisions, the quality of life, the meaningfulness of life doesn't come through sitting, looking through the screen. And I think Banksy has done a very good job commenting on this behavior. Yeah? And um, Turkle, she's also said it very well, that we come to expect more from technology than we expect from each other because technology is simple. Humans are not simple. And we want simplicity in a world that is very chaotic and unpredictable and unfamiliar as technology evolves and become ever more distant from how it works. That pen, we can't disassemble it and put it back together. 
So I want to finish with a couple of a couple of um, pieces of reflection, I guess. The first one is that we need to consider our relationships with others and how we are nurturing those relationships, how we are increasingly becoming alienated from ourselves and from others through technology and whether we wish to progress down that route. Are there things we can do to prevent that from getting worse? The second part is about the ability to make independent decisions and how technology is increasingly creating structures for which we are simply living in that we cannot challenge or that we currently are not challenging. We are just eating it raw. So maybe we need to go on a breaker camp or hacker camp and start getting back the curiosity and that need for exploration, that need for going down the unbeaten path and not just delivering on what technology and the digital communications are have created for us to live with it? Can we do things differently? And the last point is about knowledge and how we, in my opinion, need to try and retain some of that tacit knowledge we have through experience, whether that is navigating your way or whether that is selecting what movies to watch or whatever it might be. If we are putting knowledge into technology, and not expecting ourselves to grow and explore and acquire and disseminate knowledge, where will we be? We will become the machines. We will become the objects that the machines are using. Just like the digital architectures are using us. Facebook is using us to create content to make money. That's all it is. They don't care that our relationships are deteriorating. So those are some of the, the issues that I think we should reflect on, think about, talk about question and consider how we want to be humans, how we want to create relationships in this age of technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricky Deuce. I'm sure there will be some questions after this engaging talk. We have just time for two or three questions, so try and make them short. There's one here in the middle. Wait for the microphone, sir. Um, I thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. And I think it's important to think about these kind of topics. And uh, also, uh, it's interesting how they have been portrayed in sci-fi. I think it's very insightful. I'm not sure I agree with your social conclu conclusion. I, I, I'm pretty sure I, I don't. But I wanted to ask you, what are the what what would you recommend that we do to prevent all as as a society to prevent all these negative scenarios that you told us about to become real like what should we change in how we approach technology in your opinion okay um thank you i think and this was probably my purpose with with the talk was to exactly create that kind of reflection asking those questions, what do we do next? Becoming more aware of how we are participants in the creation of this, if we don't stop and think. So what to do next? I think it's a very individual choice in some level, and at some level it's a collective choice from a co corporation, especially the online corporations, in terms of how they design the technology that we live in. But I think if we have more of these conversations, if we make different choices, it can be simple as, let me find my way with a map. Can I find my way? Have I still got that knowledge? Can I still, that tacit, can I, you know, or am I reliant? You know, it's about reflecting on your own behavior as opposed to, for me to give sort of big recommendations. That's not the, that's not the purpose of the talk. It's for all of us to think through. How do we actually communicate? How do we actually create relationships? How do we actually engage in the techn technology that is being brought out there? Are we just consuming it without thinking and without thinking about how that would, that would probably evolve us in the future? 
There's a question here in the middle. The microphone. Oh, right behind you, sir. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm interested in the idea of uh, this increasing reliance on technology that we can't really understand. And um, I wonder if, along the lines of this research, you um, consider the idea of planned obsolescence and how widespread it is, and if there are any controls in place mm -hmm. about that. I don't know a lot about it, but what I've heard is quite alarming. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there is, well, just how widespread it is, really. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly Apple is famous for that. So I think it's something that is becoming more out in the open now um, across different kinds of industries. Um, it's not something I've sort of looked at immensely, uh, but you're right. I think consumers are also waking up to the fact that why is technology not lasting as long as it used to? And it's similar to the car, you know, one guy was saying he's, he still has a car that is 50 years old. How come the new cars, you're expecting them to fold maybe after 10, 12 years. They've done their time. It doesn't need to be like that. So there, the faults are being built into the technology by the corporations for financial purposes. I mean, it's, so, so what can we do? I saw a guy on um, BBC who has developed his own screwdriver because if you look at the iPhone, the screw that will enable you to take off the back and actually replace the battery, which for long has been the main problem with the iPhone, he, it's like a six-sided screwdriver that he created and he is now offering that service to others so that you can actually unlock it underneath simple normal screws. It's just that outer screw to try and deter people from resolving the issues itself, becoming creators of the product themselves. Yeah, one very quick question and a quick reply. I'm one of those guys who does know what's under the hood of the car. I've been a tinkerer all my life. Yeah. And and I'm, I'm not sure if tinkering on a car or tinkering on a computer that maybe you really don't understand is really all that different mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of being other than being in a social environment, being mm -hmm. with friends or family. So I, I, I mm -hmm. guess I'm kind of missing the point of, mm -hmm. of really what, what's the difference between how we tinkered mm -hmm. 20, 30 years ago and, mm -hmm. and how people tinker today. They, they mm -hmm. just tinker with different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is, uh, that is partly true. If you have the knowledge, now to tinker with technology, you need to be, I would say, slightly more than averagely aware of how things work. Like I said, we have now a bit of an inbuilt fear because we don't understand. A lot of us don't understand how technology works. So are you willing to put your technology to the test? to see if it can resist what you put it through, if you can't put it back again, you know. So we don't, we're not as playful, I don't think, as playful with technology as we used to be, unless you, maybe you're a programmer or a coder. Yeah, you are very creative within that environment. But we don't have that physical attachment that getting your hands into the objects and also creating new objects out of that. So I think that is what is changing. Thank you very much. Let's go home and break open our computers and iPhones. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me say thank you very much again to Ricky Deuce, and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.